Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 10. Reading. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's all turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Truly, as we have sung, O oh, the love that sought us, O oh, the blood that bought us, O oh, the grace that brought us back to the fold. We bow and we say these words, I wonder what you saw in us. Truly, there is nothing. It is purely thy infinite love, thy amazing grace alone that came to seek us out and to save us. We come tonight seeking afresh the cleansing and washing in the blood of our Saviour, asking, O God, that thou be merciful to wash away every stain. Lord, that our sins will be removed as far as the east is from the west, even from us now. At this time of gathering, Lord, would receive your blessings, that your Holy Spirit will be pleased to move mightily in our hearts, to open our eyes of understanding. O Father, may your Holy Spirit be sent tonight to speak to every child of yours in this house of thine, that as we learn your word, we may desire to see our Saviour more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow after him more closely. This is our desire, O God, tonight. We plead again that you remove the tiredness and the, of the labour of the day at home, at work, in school. And Lord, may you grant to us the joy of studying your word, and help us to concentrate that we may understand your word, Lord, in a way that is intended for us to know. So, Father, be merciful to feed your sheep in the house tonight, in this upstairs and downstairs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we come back to Hebrews. Now, we saw the last time about Christ in verse 10 being the captain of our salvation, Christ being the captain of our salvation. This is the most encouraging phrase, right? We are saved not only from the penalty of sin, but we are saved from the power of sin. And to have Christ as our captain, you are fighting, as you've learned in um, the, the church camp, you are fighting always a victory, never meant to lose any war that you get into. It's only because we choose we choose to succumb to sin. The captain of salvation, the deliverer of um, his people from the power of sin is an infinite power that is given. Anything that is needed for you to overcome, to live the overcoming life is available to you. So Christian, when we read this phrase, kept the Christ the captain of our salvation, oh, it must encourage us to embark on a life, on a life, of living victoriously for him and nothing else. No more excuses. He is the captain of our salvation. Now, tonight we want to consider this particular um, aspect um, in this verses 5 to 10, and that is the repeated mention, all right, the repeated mention of certain things. Look at verse 5. 
Now, angels are not put, uh, things are not put under the, um, um, under the subjection of angels. But look at verse 6. They say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Instead, verse 7 tells us, well, it is man that God crowns with glory and honour. And look at verse 7 again, and set him over the works of thy hands. So look at verse 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. So this constant um, trend of thought, what is it about? What must we learn? Constantly talking about it, things of the world are not put under subjection to the angels, but put under the subjection of men. And that is why you crown him with honor and you with glory. Now, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Now, look at verse 8. Oh, sorry, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels. Here we go again about being little lower than angels. And then this phrase comes again in verse 9. Crown with glory and honor. Crown with glory and honor. Look at verse 7. He's quoting Psalm 8. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. All right? So this repeated idea of crowning with honor and glory, what are we to learn? What are we to learn? The title tonight is Man Crowned with Glory and Honor. Man Crowned with Glory and Honor. Now do not forget the theme. Christ is the supreme prophet. And Christ, to be the supreme prophet, he, was, he came in the form of man and in his human nature. He was supreme, all right, also over angels because they will begin to think, well, if he's man, then he's not so supreme as a prophet, right? Angels are better than men. Angels know more things about heaven than men. So if Christ is man, then, well, he's not much of a prophet. So here is the argument that the apostle wants to, the people to realize. Well, yes, Christ came as man, but he is still the supreme prophet, far above angels in his prophesyings, all right, which is covered in chapter 2, the, the first part. Christ's prophecies, Christ's prophesying is far superior. The angels that you, take, uh, that you pay attention to, right? Now, but here, he begins to talk about men being crowned with honor and glory. Now, how is this all tied together with Christ being supreme in his humanity, Christ being supreme as a man. What is the link and what is, it for, what is there for us to learn? Now, first and foremost, look at verse 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou, that thou visitest him? Then he says, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor. Now, and then he says in verse 8, now, for in that he put all things, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now, but now, means now, we are living as human beings, living, still alive. Now we see not yet all things put under him. What is he saying? He said, well, you know, you know the Bible, you know the scriptures. The Old Testament says that, well, God crowns man a little lower than the angels. But I say, how is it so? So some of the Jews may ask, how is it so? We don't see that. So he replies in verse, in verse 9. Oh, sorry, in verse, in verse 8. But now we see not yet all things under him. So while we are living on earth, man, the, the believer, man, we do not see this crowning with glory and honor fully yet. We don't see that yet. All right? But look at verse 9. But we see Jesus. But when it comes to Christ, the man, Christ, the man, you see him now crowned with glory and honor. Not us, not us, but Christ, we see him crowned with glory and honor. Now, dear hearers, one day, if you're a true believer, you will be crowned with honor and glory. Do you realize that? The question is, what does it mean? What does it mean? What do you think it means? Like, for example, um, very often when believers pass away, right, um, go to be with the Lord, uh, for example, we'll be attending uh, Jason's father's funeral uh, to Monday night, right, uh, vigil service on Monday night and Wednesday, the burial service. 
Well, you will see in program booklets saying, well, gone home to be in glory, right? Or something like that. Very often at funerals, you see that. Then someone asks, oh, you know, um, is your believing father around? Oh, my believing father has gone home in glory. Now, what does it mean? What do you think it means? And here we say, we see God says, thou crownest man with glory and honor. What do you think it means? Maybe I'll try. Um, Yanwei, what do you think it means? Man crowned with glory and honor. When people die, you say, gone home to be in glory. Say again. Finish journey on earth and be with the Lord. Why is it called in glory? Without sin anymore, all right? Without sin anymore. Now, when we say it is glorious to be perfect, we are saying we, we are no more with sin. We reflect the glory of God perfectly, all right? So the first thing when we say, well, we'll be crowned with glory when we die or we go home to be in glory. Now, firstly, it means you'll be without sin. With the, that is why it's called the glorious body, is without sin. And why is it glorious? Because, well, you will reflect all the glorious attributes of God, the perfect attributes. Now, of course, um, it is not omniscience, omnipotence, um, omnipresence, right? Those are the attributes of God that are not communicable. We understand that. But every other attribute, right? The fruit of the Spirit, all this perfection of the fruit of the Spirit will be there. That is why it's glorious. Hmm? So when men see God, God is glorious. Now, the, those are the attributes right, that they will see in us. So when you say we want to reflect Christ, we want to glorify God, what are we saying? We want to live a life that shows man what God is, who God is, how God thinks, how God works, because those are the glorious attributes of God. So that's why we must be Christ-like. We must walk as Christ walked in order to glorify God. So that's the first part, sinlessness. That is why it's glorious. We now have all, this, all the perfect attributes that God intended when he created Adam and Eve. He intended for Adam and Eve, man to have that. But man chose to sin, right? So it's fallen. It is not glorious. It's fallen, fallen. Now, so that's the first one. Um, so it's perfection, perfection, sinless perfection. Now, what else does it mean? Well, we know for sure it does not mean we will, we will be glorious like God, right? So we cannot say, well, um, God will crown us with glory, then it's, we are crowned with the glory of the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, right? His infinite uh, power. It's not that glory. So it's always a reflected glory, perfection. Now, what do you think is the second state? The second state. Maybe I try. Someone else. Um, Benedict. What do you think is the second state? Physical aspect of not being? We don't get tired. All right, so the glorious body. Yeah, those are the glorious aspects, all right? So that's the first one, all right? The, the perfection. We won't get tired and all that. Now, if you look at how it is described, look at verse 6. But in a certain place, he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? All right? And then after that, he says, Well, you crown him with glory and honor. Now, when we studied this, we studied about mindful, all right? Visit. Do you remember what it means? Mindful is God has a certain, um, has thoughts that are planned, purposeful thoughts, um, wonderful, good thoughts towards man, mindful. That, and then this visit, this visit is not just, well, visit with no purpose. Visit with a purpose to bless, all right? So God has wonderful 
good intentions towards man. He cares. He's thoughtful about man. And not only that, he would visit man. He would give purpose to man, right? Knowing that man, man is nothing in the eyes of God. But yet he thinks of us, but yet he wants us to have certain things. He would visit us. And to visit would mean that, well, God, God we, are, we, are, we are graced with the presence of God, right? The presence of God, being in the presence of God. So God not only thinks about man, but God will visit man. Well, for example, I think the most wonderful time for mankind was when Christ was on earth, God with man, Emmanuel, right? The name itself reminds us that Emmanuel, God with man, that is how God graced us with his presence. So the second thing about being crowned with glory, it is actually to be in the presence of the living God. That is why we say he has gone home to be in glory. What does it mean? Right? Not just, well, no more aches and pain, but it is about in the presence of the almighty creator. Now, hear us. Think about this. When you are invited, when you are invited to attend um, the, some ceremony of um, the, the most powerful man on earth, for example, right? Now, for example, the, 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 the wedding um, of, of some royalties. Then you see in, in, the, in the video in the church, well, only very specific people are invited to come. So before they enter, they must show right, their invitation card. So these are invited into the presence, right? Grace, graciously thinking about who to invite and then actually visiting them in the sense of visiting them with a blessing or say, come, come to this royal event. So not all will know that glorious um, 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 privilege of being in the presence of royalty, right? So when we say gone home to be in glory, that is what it means. Not only in perfection, then in perfection, but in perfection in the presence of the almighty creator of the universe. Think about this. Now, I think we really need to think more about who Christ is. If you look at um, chapter 1, all right, chapter 1, now verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. This is how Christ is introduced to us as supreme prophet, but he is the one who made the world. All the things in this universe. Can you imagine any more glorious um, privilege that you can ever experience? than to be in the presence of he who created the worlds. Unthinkable. Do you ever think about things like that? The glorious thought of that. All right, so now the second one is this, really the, the, the presence. So the first one is the perfection. The second one is, well, the presence of the living God. So that is what it means that man is crowned with glory. You are crowned with this, this wonderful um, presence of God. It is an honor. That is why it's crowned with glory and honor. Right? The glorious body. The honor of being in the presence of God. That is what it is. Do you treasure such a, pres such a thing one day? Very often people say, I, I do not want to die. Because there are many places that I still I have not seen. There are many things I have not done. I want to see my grandchildren uh, being born, and so on and so on. Right? When people talk like that, then you begin to realize, well, that is how we are. We don't see being in the presence of the glorious God as well something wonderful, something as a crown, being crowned with honor and glory. Now, those who are invited to attend the royal wedding, all right? Compared to, well, being um, uh, invited to attend some other uh, um, wonderful events, they would say it's far more wonderful to be in the presence of this event, right? So, that is the second one. 
um, thou visit, thou, thou mindful him, thou visitest him that is being in the presence of God. Now, the other one, the third one. Now, actually, from here, you will be able to figure out the third one. What do you think is the third one? Look at verse 5, all right? Then look at verse 8. What do you think is the third the third thing about being crowned with glory and honor. What do you think it is? Look at verse 5 and verse 8. In fact, verse 5, 7, and 8. 5, 7, and 8. Um, Hazel, what do you think it is? Very good. That all things will be put under the subjection of men. Look at verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. He said, you know, even in the world to come, and we're going to look at some verses afterwards. The world to come. Christian, do you realize in the world to come means in heaven, in future, in, in, through eternity, the future world, right? You're sitting there now. In the future world, things will be put under your subjection. Not even the angels. You will rule angels instead. For now, temporarily, a little lower than them. But all things will be put under your subjection. When God created man, he did not say, or created everything in this world, he did not say, angels, from now onwards, you rule. Angels will rule better than us, right? They can fly. We cannot, man, Adam and Eve could not. They are tireless, right? Adam and Eve, still man, still human. But God did not put the running, the dominion of, of, of the world to angels, but he gave it to men. The mindfulness of thought of God towards men, well, that is what an honor. All right? Now look at verse, verse um, 7. Then he says, yes, for now, made a little lower than angels, but say, you will crown him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thine hand. Things that God made. God intends that man will rule. And then look at verse, um, verse 9, all right? Oh, sorry, verse 8. And that's it, right? So um, 5, 7, and 8. Now, it becomes very clear. In fact, if you turn to these quotations of Psalm, Psalm chapter 8, all right? Let's turn to Psalm chapter 8. You see it more clearly, clearly. Psalm chapter 8. So, the apostle is quoting Psalm chapter 8, all right? Now, let's read verses 3, all right, to 9, 3 to 9. Psalm 8, verses 3 to 9. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is the name in all the earth. Now he is quoting Psalm 8, and you will notice the same phrases, almost identical. And then, look, how he describes. After verse 5, he said, You crown him with honor and glory. And he said, Thou madest him do, to have dominion over the works of thy hand and put all things under his feet. Dominion, dominion. That is the glory and the honor that God crowns upon men. When God created Adam and Eve, he said, Now go and take care of my creation. That is an honor. That is, the man, that is man's glory. Now, if you look at Psalm 8, the question is this. Um, now, are all things meant for men to dom dominate and then um, to use it for ourselves? No, it is not. The, it is an honor and glory because you are now going to have dominion over those things that God intends to use. Right? So God created this world. He had purposes for this world. He had certain intention for this world. 
And God let men, not angels, God let men have all the resources. He said, you have dominion over the resources that I make. And you will use them, you will use them to glorify me. You will use them to fulfill my purpose. That is the honour and the glory that we have. Just like you join a company, right? You join a company. And then the big boss, the CEO says, you know, I am going to let you have dominion over all that is in the company. What do you think the, the CEO is saying? Right? He is telling you everything. He gives you all the power to use everything to fulfill his purposes. Right? It is not for you to use to do whatever you want. So when God says he crowned men with honor and glory, now, dominion brings honor and glory. Right? We know. If you're a ruler, you have dominion, you have honor and glory. Right? And this honor and glory is that God chose men to, fulfill, to be the one, his instruments. And you see, you will have everything you need. i let you control them to bring glory to me, right? So three Ps. First, when we talk about, well, men will be crowned with honor and glory. Man has honor and glory. Go home to be in glory. One day we'll be in glory. What does it mean? The first P is perfection sinless perfection. The second P is, well, the presence of God, to live forever in the presence of the Almighty God. If the royalty say, forever you will live in my presence, you say, wow, what honor, what glory you bestow upon me, right? And then the third P, that is, well, it has to do with a privilege, a privilege, right, to have the power to fulfill God's purposes, to have the privilege given with power to fulfill God's purposes. So when we say God crowned men with honor and glory, these thoughts based on Psalm 8 and Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, begins to help us to understand more. What does it mean? Now, when we ultimately think of this, isn't this the fruition, all right? The final completion of our salvation. Look at verse uh, Hebrews. Let's turn back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. All right. To make the captain of their salvation perfect. Now, Christ's work of propitiation through suffering is completed. And that is why it's perfect. All right. And because of that, one day our salvation will come to full perfection as well. It is not perfect yet. Not that Christ's work is not perfect. But we have not reached the final fruition of God's intention for salvation. It is now we have only confirmed our salvation. One day there is this perfection that God intends to bring to us. Number one, perfection. Number two, to live in His presence forever. Number three, to have the privilege to serve Him forever. That is the final fruition. Please understand that. All right? So Christian, don't just think, well, I look forward to go home in glory and all you think about is walking on streets of gold and enjoying um, uh, the presence of uh, angels and well, a very nice environment. You won't feel any pain or um, sickness anymore. No, it is not that. All right? It's far more than that. So whenever we think of death, we must think, of the final fruition one day, even after death, and then when is the body and soul coming together, and then into, like we study in teens, the new heaven and new earth forever and ever, all right, in perfect righteousness and only perfect righteousness. That is all. Now, when you think about that, is this not the chief end of men? This is not chief end of men. What's the chief end of men? To glorify God and to enjoy Him now, forever. This is the, the completion of crowning man with honor and glory. To glorify God, well, we will never, ever shame God anymore. We will only live in perfection. We will always sing praises perfectly to praise and honor Him. All right? That is the perfection. We will glorify God perfectly into eternity. Chief end of men. And then the second one, which is to enjoy Him forever. Now, isn't being in the presence of God 
a perfect enjoyment. Isn't having the privilege to serve the living God the perfect enjoyment of God? Because when you are perfect, you will enjoy serving God. I hope that you enjoy serving God now and not or it's a, it's a chore. You rather serve God, you rather be with God than anyone else, right? So this, these are things that you look forward to the final fruition of your salvation by the captain of your salvation. That is what it is. Glorifying Him, enjoying Him by praising Him in His presence and the privilege of doing things for Him. That is enjoying God. You love someone, you enjoy doing things for the person. That is how it is. So this enjoy God, please don't think of it as, I enjoy God. So enjoy God means God does things for me. It's a very different concept today. That is why it is a, it's the problems in marriage. In marriages are so rife because they are, the thinking is, well, if I want to enjoy marriage, means someone pleases me, someone serves me. It's very contrary to the understanding of, of Christian love. When you love a brethren, right, even as a single, care for another person, you find it a joy. You enjoy helping another person, right? So this is the final fruition of the Christian life into eternity, crowning, being crowned with honour and glory. So I hope that it becomes much clearer to all of us, right? Not just, well, um, being able to fly around in heaven and then the body glowing or something and then, wow, I'm so glorious kind of thing. Now, question number two. Does verse 7, 8, and 9 mean that all believers will be crowned with honour and glory automatically when we get to heaven? Explain your answers. Now, what do you think? Does it mean from, well, I would say from 5, 6, 7, 8, and, um, and so on, does it mean that all of us will be crowned with honour and glory? What do you think? Right? Does it mean all believers will be crowned? Hey, Mabel, do you think so? Yes, all right. Well, well, it depends, right? Yes, and depends, I would say, to what extent will you be crowned with glory, honour and glory? Well, definitely, the first P, perfection, all of us will be crowned with that, correct? So we will be crowned with the honour and glory of having a sinless perfection, of sinless perfection, so definitely that. Now, being um, um, crowned with honour and glory, to have the honour to be in the presence of the living God forever, yes, definitely, all of us will be crowned with that. Now, but the question is this, what about the privilege, the privilege, all right, um, to the privilege with the power to serve God and fulfil His purposes into eternity? Do you think all will be the same? What do you think? Um, Richard, do you think all will be the same? All will have the same um, level of honour and glory when it comes to the privilege of um, serving God with the, with the same amount, of, same level of power to use that power to fulfil God's um, plan and purposes. Do you think it will, all will be crowned with the same honour and glory? Not all. We have all the we have spiritual gifts and then Oh I see. So in heaven the different crowns will be given. Right? How many types of crowns? Oh God will decide how many crowns you can stick on your head. <laughs> all right? Well the Bible does talk about different crowns, all right? Maybe one day we'll study that. Um, there are different crowns in the Bible. We have um, a crown of martyrdom, right? crown of looking forward to the coming of Christ, crown of uh, endurance, different crown, different crowns, all right? So yes, in the first place, the Bible does talk about different crowns, different crowns, number one. Now, why do you think that it will be different? And can we tell from the context, all right? Can we tell from the context? Now, Christ has two glories, 
mentioned in the Bible. Do you realize that? Two glories mentioned in the Bible. What's the first one? The first one is easy to know, right? So what's the first one? Um, maybe I try Caleb. What's the first one? Say again. His what? His humanity. Uh, okay, so we have humanity, glory, and then what's the other one? His deity, all right? His deity. Now look at chapter, chapter 1, chapter 1. Chapter 1. Um, look at, let's read verses 5 and 6 together. For unto which of the angels, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, reading. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. So this is his first glory. The angels, all the angels of God will worship Christ. Now, why must they worship him? Simple answer found in verse 5 and 6. He is God's son. When he's God's son, means he is God, right? So the first one is the first glory of Christ. The first aspect is intrinsically simply because he is the son. He is deity. He is God. He is God. Simple as that, nothing else. Now, if you turn, now keep, keep your hands there, keep, your, keep, keep a bookmark in Hebrews 1. Turn to, um, let's see, turn to John 17. Right? Let's turn to John 17. John 17. Now, the glory of Christ is veiled, all right, covered now because of his human flesh. Now, then we, chapter 17, verse 4. So, Christ now prays to the Father. Now, let us read verse, um, chapter 17, verses 4 to 7, verse, verse 4 to 5 together. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You see, his intrinsic glory, even before the world, the universe was formed, Christ already had that glory, being the Son of God. So this is intrinsically there. And he says, now God, um, it is time to reveal to the world who I am, that they may see me and see my glory, and that is the glory that I had with you even before the world, before time existed. So that is his first glory, all right? This is his first glory. Now, but I want you to note in verse 4, he says, I've glorified thee on the earth. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Then he prayed about glory, all right? First, now let's turn back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. Now the question we're trying to answer is this, right? So don't, don't lose track. The question to answer is, will we all in this room be crowned with sinless perfection? Yes. To be crowned with the honour of being in the presence of God forever and ever? Yes. But now the question is, will we, can we interpret this and simply read, all of us will be crowned with the same level of honour and glory when it comes to the privilege to have the power to serve the purposes of God. Will we all be the same? Turn back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Now look at first verse 7. When it comes to glory, honor and glory, crown of man, one of the things that's related to it, remember, is dominion. Dominion. Look at verse 7. And did set him over the work of thy hand, works of thy hand, dominion. Now, then he says in verse 8, well, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. We read in Psalm 8. But he says, well, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Not yet. Not yet. Look at verse 9, and I want you to think about this. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus crowned with, uh, so I skip, uh, crowned with glory and honour. 
we see, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Now, we don't see ourselves as men crowned with glory and honor, but we see Jesus. Of course, they're not seeing Jesus physically, but they know, all right? They have this knowledge, this complete knowledge that Jesus is in heaven and is crowned in heaven with honor and glory. Not that they can see into heaven and see, all right? But they have this complete knowledge, very clear, perfect knowledge. That is exactly what Christ is crowned with, honor and glory. But now I want to ask you one question, all right? Now, all the while, he's been talking about Christ as son um, and so on. But now, he says, but we see Jesus. Why do you think he says Jesus? Maybe Jonathan. Why do you think he would say, but we see Jesus? Why don't you say, but we see God? Why don't you say, but we see the son? Why don't you say, but we see the, um, Christ? But you say, but we see Jesus. Crowned with honor and glory. Very good. So it ref now he wants them to know. Now I want to point you to Jesus, the 100% man about his humanity, the man Jesus, all right? The perfect man Jesus, who is also the perfect God, all right? Now he said, I want you to notice when it comes to Jesus, the man, he is now crowned with honor and glory. Now, why is it that Jesus is crowned with honor and glory, but not us yet? Why? Why? The answer is found in verse 9. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He is crowned with honor and glory because now he tasted death, he's resurrected, and he's gone back to heaven. He tasted death for every man. He came to fulfill the propitiation work. The reason why we see Jesus crowned in heaven in honor and glory as in his human body is because he has finished the propitiation work that is why he is there but not us have we finished our work on earth not yet that is why we are still on earth which is why we repeatedly say why are we still on earth because we have not finished god's intended work for us on earth that is why we're still here but but we see jesus that man he died finished god's work and look at verse verse 10 now to to what point he was made perfect through suffering he completed the work of salvation perfectly completely even if it means that he must suffer immeasurably. He finished it. He finished it. Now, what am I trying to help us to learn? The reason why Christ, the man, is crowned. Remember, I say God says that, well, what is man that thou mindful him, that you will crown man? Even Christ crowning of honor and glory is contingent upon him finishing the work that God intended for him to do, to finish his purpose. Please understand that. This is what the apostle wants us to realize. You want to be crowned with honor and glory completely to the fullest to which God wants to crown man with. You will be crowned with the perfect body you will be crowned in his presence, the on, to have the honor in his presence. But please, when it comes to this one thing, your work is not finished, but Christ's work is finished. Even as man, and this is what I want to, us to realize, even as God, who became man, needed to ensure that he exercised the dominion given to him to finish God's work, then he would be crowned with honor and glory as man. Because Christ is 100% God, 100% man. His 100% man part also required him to finish in order for him to be crowned with honor and glory as man. Then he must fulfill the third P, which is to use the dominion that God gave to him, the power that God gave to him to finish God's purpose then he will be crowned. That is why he said, well, for now, look at verse 8. For now, we see not yet all things put under our feet. But we see Jesus, that man, is finished. 
He finished it perfectly. Now the question is this, will you and I go to heaven, crown fully as God intend to crown us? It is related to the dominion. It's related to rulership. Now, will you and I rule as God intended us for, rule, for us to rule? Because it's dominion in heaven, right? Into eternity. Will you and I have that? Now, I want you to um, realize what the Apostle Paul is, uh, if you believe it's a possible writing, determined to tell the Christian don't just think that you're going to heaven, you'll be automatically crowned as Christ will be crowned in the fullest extent. But you and I can be crowned to the fullest extent that God intend to crown men in heaven to rule, to have dominion. God's intention is for men to have dominion over angels and over other things. Now, if you turn with me to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. Oh, Luke chapter 19. Christ gave a view of heaven, a glimpse of heaven. Look at verse 12, Luke chapter 19. Verse 12. All right. Uh, let's, read verse, well, let's read from verses 11, all right? From verses 11, actually all the way to 25 reading. 11 to 25 reading. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now, what would the kingdom of God be like? Here, God explains. Look at verse 12. A certain man, a certain no, let's read together, 12 to 25. He said, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And unto them, occupy till I come. But his, citizenship, his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, they commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And he came to the first saying, Lord, thy ten pound that gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well done, well, thou, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, thou hast authority over ten cities. Now look, it's about authority, dominion, rulership. When he talks about heaven, he talks about rulership. Now, then in verse 18, let's continue. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, there is, there is, here is thy pound which I have kept. They have laid up in napkin, for I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, and takest that, that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And so on and so on, all right? So we will not read the rest. The, the, other, the rest is the unbeliever, the unbeliever. But I want you to note, let's read verse, verses 24 to 25 together. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him, that ten pounds. And, he said, and they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. The ten pounder ruling ten cities. The five pounder ruling five cities. And when there is something to be given, more to be ruled, take it and give it to the ten-pounder. Now, God does talk about rulership, dominion in heaven, which is why when we read, um, when we read the psalm, Psalm 8, it talks about ruling well, over all that he has, even into eternity. Now, if you also know that the account in Matthew 25, you don't have to turn there, Matthew 25, 23, it says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right? So now we realize one thing. Now we begin to realize that this crowning with rulership, and we also read in Revelation, where, where we will rule with Christ. 
So there are hierarchy, there are, there are rulership, there are different dominions, there are different. We will all, number one, have the perfect, sinless um, um, body. We will all be in the presence of the living God. But when it comes to dominion into eternity, it all depends on how you live now. It all depends on that. Like Christ made sure, I am 100% man, I am man, and even for me to be crowned with honour and glory like a man, I must make sure I finish my work perfectly. And he will be perfectly crowned. Alright? So don't think that simply because we all will go to heaven, we will be crowned with the same honour and glory in degree. It will be different. Christ repeatedly gave examples like that. Now, that is why he says, occupy till I come. He told them, occupy till I come. Because until, you, until I come, these things are not put under your feet yet. It's not too late. Occupy till I come as man. Here the apostle says the same thing. We don't see these things yet, but we see Jesus. Now, let's turn back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Now let us then walk as Jesus walked. But we see Jesus, the man. God endows us with dominion on earth now. The captain of your salvation, like we studied previously, is, makes available anything that is needed for you to fulfill his purpose on earth. Everything. You may think it is not possible to live like that, to do that, to give this up, to, to, to follow Christ this way and that way. You may think it is not possible, but you know the truth. He is the captain of your salvation. He is the almighty God who spoke the universe into existence. All dominion and Peter said, all that is needed for faith, for living out your Christian faith, is available to you. The power is there. You have that dominion. You have that privilege to serve God, to live for God now, to fulfill His purpose on earth. Not see now how you'll be crowned in heaven, but we see Jesus. You see Jesus. Now this crowning, all right, this crowning, this crowning. Some commentators, well, they say, you know, this, remember the, the crowning of the Bhima seed, all right, the crowning of the Bhima seed. Now, it talks about these athletes, all right, these athletes, they will prepare, they will, they will train very hard, all right, they will do all that they can in order to wear that crown, all right? That, that crown that is made of, um, um, well, leaves or just twigs kind of thing. Um, but not the Christian, all right? The Christian strives for a crown that does not fade away. And it's understood that these people, well, um, they will fight very hard. They will run very hard. They will train very hard. Now, but... If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, right? let's, let's see the concept from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Um, well, maybe we should read from verses 24. Um, 24 and 25 reading. Know ye not that they which run in the race all run, um, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Verse 26. Um, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, certain, uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Let's read verse 27 as also, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, 
when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, what is Paul describing? This crown, right? We will all be crowned. But there is this crowning for dominion and rulership into eternity. What will it be for us? For Paul, he understood this. And he said, I will work, I will, I will keep my body down, I will control myself, I will discipline myself, I will take up my cross, I will not let my flesh all right, do what he wants. Because Paul understands that when he reaches heaven, did what kind of crown, how he will be crowned, how much to the degree of honor and glory is going to depend on now. And he said, this is how the people of the world, they run in this um, Greek athletic, uh, Greek um, uh, games. They, they strive for that. I strive for something eternal. Now, when he says this, look at verse 10. That I myself should, um, and he said, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He said, I keep my body under and I keep it under subjection. Now, what is this castaway? Because in those games, this is how it works. In those games. Now, um, only the Greek citizens, all right, so this is what people understand in these games, only the Greek citizens are allowed to participate in this race. So the idea is just like us, only believers, we participate in this race. We don't race against each other, all right, we don't race against each other. All right, we don't race against each other, we race against ourselves. To, like Paul said, I, I press myself, not to compete with anyone, because I am aiming for a certain price myself. Now, what is this cast away then? Now, but any Greek citizen, if, now, he did not run the race properly, all right? Not according to the rules, not according to the standard, and he did something that is, that disqualifies him. So this cast away is being disqualified, disapproved, Right? This is not losing salvation. Because what will happen to the Greek city, to this, to this athlete? He will forfeit the crown. He will forfeit the crown. But he will not lose his citizenship. He will remain a Greek citizen. But he will forfeit the crown. Right? So it's a very apt example, I guess, that the Apostle Paul wants to use. Believers, we will all have the sinless body. We will all be in the presence of God. We will not forfeit our salvation. But we can forfeit the degree of crowns the degree of honor and glory that God intended for you. So Paul says, I want to press now. I know I'm going to have, I won't lose my citizenship in heaven, but I will press now. Now we live under the delusion and Satan wants you to think that. We're all going to heaven, we'll all be crowned. We all will have honor, we all will have glory. So why bother, right? Why bother? Let's just live as we wish to, do as we wish to, because after all, all of us are going to be crowned. Now, I keep sharing this example with you, and some of you may be new. So, I remember one night, you know, late at night, a family called me up. They're no longer with us in church. A family called me up. I said, and they said Pastor, we, our whole family have a question for you. I said, wow, it was so serious, you know, it was late at night. Um, and I said, what's the question? I said, we've been discussing, and we come, come, to, come to a conclusion. And then they said, you know, when we all go to heaven, will it all be equal? Right? Will all of us be equal? Then I didn't want to answer. I asked, why do you ask the question? And say, um, the person said, well, you know, if, all be, if you're all equal, and you should be, right? When you go to heaven, all are equal. Then, then why, why, why give up my job? Why give up my, my luxuries? Why, why give up my positions? When these things come in my way of living for Christ, obedience, why give this up? Because there's no difference. At least on earth, if I work very hard, well, I get promoted. Right? I am somebody in this world. I get respect. I get honor. I get glory. Well, if all are the same, then when we get to heaven, what's the point? I may as well live for myself now. I get honor and glory now. And when I go to heaven, I still will go to heaven. All of us the same. Do not forget. You have the, per if you are truly saved. But I really wonder about people who think like that. But if you're truly saved, right? You have the perfect body, yes. You're truly saved, you'll be in the presence of God forever, yes. But if you are living a life that is not, 
making use of the dominion, the things, the power that God gives to you, the gifts, the abilities and all that, to fulfill the purpose of God, where you fulfill your own purposes, God already says, we will rule with him into eternity. Some will rule more cities than others. It is different. Now, when we think about all this, what must we learn? That's the question. Right? Must, what must we learn? Even Christ set the example as man. For me, when God says man will be crowned with honour and glory, that is my, my job is to suffer and die for this, for, to save my people. That is my job and I will finish it. You have different jobs. You have a different will of God for your life. You too must finish it. Don't compare it with mine. It's different, right? But you have yours. Question is, are you truly fulfilling your purpose? Are you, would you rather choose to be in a place that is not God's will for you? Whatever it is, a workplace, um, a situation in life, whatever it is, would you rather choose that and deceive yourself and think, well, I will go to heaven anyway. All will be the same. God has a plan for you. Do you want to forfeit that? That is what Paul is saying. I do not want to be, well, a castaway. I don't want to be a disapproved runner. I do not wa I want Christ to say, well done. I do not want Christ to say, well, castaway, forfeited. The crown that I intended for you, forfeited. You can forfeit that. Now let's turn to the last passage and then we close. First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three. Right? Let's read from verses twelve to fifteen. Now this is one of my favorite passage that I often quote to you all, all right? Let's read 12 to 15 together. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Now here God makes it very clear. Verse 12 is about your foundation. You don't have to lay. Christ paid for you, for your sins, and sinless perfection in the living in the presence of God. That foundation is laid already. But now, every man's work while on earth. will What kind of honor and glory will you be crowned with? What's the degree? It's going to depend on what you do on earth. Look at verse 15. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yes, you'll be saved, but you will suffer loss. Please take off the note, note, note of the word suffer and loss. Put together for eternity. Suffer loss. You won't lose your soul, yes, if you're truly saved. Suffer loss. Christ had two glories. The first one is his intrinsic one, as son of God. In chapter 2 of Hebrews, you see the second glory, as man crowned with honour and glory because, because he made sure that he fulfilled and finished his task as captain of our salvation and finished it perfectly. That is why now he is crowned with glory and honour. Paul says it, the, the apostles makes it very clearly, says it very clearly. But we see Jesus, the man, crowned. That is his second aspect of his glory. That aspect we as man can have, but depends on how you live. You cannot have the first aspect of God's glory, being God. But the second aspect, but we see Jesus. But will you see yourself crowned to the degree that God intends to crown you? 
When we come back, we answer the questions like, well, isn't it unfair? Because some people get saved later, right? Like Jason's father got saved just a few months before the Lord took him home. What's the opportunity to serve? Then less crown, less glory. Is it fair? Right? Should we serve for honor and glory? We will answer those questions, God willing, when we return. Now let us all pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from